So let me introduce the first speaker, Craig Thompson. Craig is one of those who was one of the instigators of the current resuscitation of interest in the Warburg effect and metabolism. Uh, prior to that, he worked a lot on apoptosis and has a long and illustrious career. He's currently the uh, president and CEO of the Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. And prior to that, he was in a similar position at the Abramson Cancer Center in Philadelphia. And prior to that, he was in the University of Chicago. And uh, as I said, has a long and illustrious career in various aspects of cancer biology. And it's a great pleasure to have Craig here today. He's going to tell us what oncogenic metabolites are telling us about cancer. Craig, thank you. Well, it's a pleasure to be here and get a chance to share some of the data that we've acquired over the last uh, year or two in this field of cancer uh, cell metabolism. Um, the people that are going to have done the work that I'm going to show here, a couple of them are in the audience, uh, in particular Patrick Ward that's done a large part of the work I'll do. Um, so when people afterwards want to know any of the specific details, Patrick will be out back to explain it all. Um, we've had a delightful collaboration since we've moved to Memorial Sloan Kettering with the laboratories of Ross Levine and Ari Melnick around some of the stuff I'll tell you about the applications of metabolic insights into leukemia, along with our colleague, a former colleague at Penn, Martin Carroll. And a lot of the work that I'm going to tell you about oncogenic metabolites would not have been possible without the collaborations with Agios Pharmaceuticals uh, and Josh Rabinovitz's laboratory at Princeton. So they're the people that have done that. Now, the first slide. Uh, is actually a slide that should be uh, familiar to you all by this point because many people have put up a metabolic slide. We became interested in this area about a decade ago when we became interested in the idea that oncogenic signaling pathways, as summarized from Bob Weinberg's book that he published in 2006, intersected with the regulation of metabolic pathways as summarized, and this was Don Nicholson's last version of a metabolic chart he published in 2007. And so for the last 10 years, we have looked at to see what are the connections between the initiation of signal transduction and the entrainment and regulation of metabolism that might fuel, as everybody else has said in this meeting, not catabolism, where you, where you basically eke out enough ATP by breaking everything you can acquire down to uh, CO2 and water to generate the maximum amount of ATP. As Matt said, he, he learned it could be 36 equivalents for each glucose. That, in the end, doesn't make for a growing cell or a cell that can divide. But to really understand how metabolism is informed to now become anabolic, so that you hold back enough precursors of the nutrients you take to be able to build all the macromolecules necessary for cell division. And our reason to get into that, as Richard said, is at the time we became interested in this idea, we'd been working in the field of apoptosis. And we were working on a, a one unique, but we thought essentially important uh, uh, experiment in mammalian cell biology, and that was this so-called death by neglect. And at that point, in the late 1990s, every laboratory interested in a particular cell type had done the following apoptotic experiment. They would take their favorite cell out, make a single cell suspension in complete media absent serum growth factors, and that cell would initiate an apoptotic response within 48 to 96 hours. And so the cell's default program, when neglected, by not receiving the paracrine and hormonal signals that it would normally receive from the environment, the cell was able to recognize that over a meaningful period of time of 48 to 96 hours and execute itself. And a postdoc in the laboratory at that time, Jeff Rathmill, became to asking, what happens in that 48 hours before a cell dies by death by neglect? What's this default pathway of suicide actually sensing? And what Jeff discovered is, what was a very much a surprise to us at that time is that the most exquisitely growth factor regulated uh, proteins that existed in cells that we had ever found were actually nutrient transporters. And so that when you start that experiment and take a cell out of its normal physiologic environment so it no longer reveals the normal trophic factors it gets from its nearest neighbors or from the hormonal systems in the body, the cell starts a clock when it loses this ligand induction. And that clock is initiated by the processing of all the nutrient transporters off the cell surface. So all the glucose transporters in the first 12 hours, all the amino acid transporters in the first 12 hours are processed off the surface. And even though the cell continues to be bathed in lots of nutrients, it can't take them up. At that point, the coil has irrevocably started a clock to apoptosis. That clock works because of the declining bioenergetics as it uses intercellular metabolites available to it to maintain mitochondrial bioenergetics. Various stress pathways are activated in cysts in the cell. 
that activate so-called BH3 proteins that regulate the BCL2 family of genes. And ultimately, the declining bioenergetic signature of the mitochondria, combined with the stress pathways that are being activated by the decline in bioenergetics that's occurring, leads to the initiation of apoptosis through the essential effectors of death by neglect, backs or back, which we found were mutually redundant. And by knocking them out with Stan Korsmeyer's laboratory a few years ago, we're able to show you could completely eliminate the apoptotic response by death by neglect. But when we did that, what we discovered in every lineage of the body is that that didn't rescue the cell back to full health because the cell was still starving to death. It allowed us to, to, to unmask an ancient pathway that Eileen White will talk about in, in great extent later. It is that the cell to survive bioenergetically, so it still hasn't recovered its ability to take up the nutrients that are in its environment, is that it starts to self-catabolize itself by taking intracellular substrates that are available sequestering them into autophagosomes and initiating the degradation of those substrates in the lysosome and then fueling the breakdown products created by the proteases and lipases that are in the lysosome to fuel substrates that the mitochondria can continue to maintain bioenergetics. And in that way, the cell can eke out its survival for another two to four weeks, but ultimately it dies of a bioenergetic catastrophe. So death by neglect, we argued 10 years ago, had one essential feature we had all overlooked. The fundamental feature is that cells don't need to be told, talked out of apoptosis every day. They need to be told to eat. And they needed to be told to eat in sufficient quantities to maintain their own integrity, to maintain ATP production so that they can maintain order in the cell and to maintain replacement molecular biosynthesis. Well, the consequence of accepting that as a hypothesis is that we had to then say there had to be signal transduction that instructed cells to take up nutrients from their environment. And in fact, you've heard from many of the preceding um, speakers about the signaling pathways that have now and the connections that have been uncovered between receptor, particularly tyrosine kinase-based signal transduction, and the instruction to take up specific nutrients. The first that we were able to uncover was the PI3 was receptor tyrosine kinase activation of PI3 kinase and its downstream activation of the serine threonine kinase AKT, and that directed the surface translocation of glucose transporters so that glucose could be taken up. It controlled the activation of phosphorylation of that intracellular glucose, the glucose 6-phosphate, and it allosterically activated glycolysis by activating PFK1, the initiation state of catabolism of glucose in the glycolytic pathway. So AKT coordinates these three pathways and reprocesses cellular bioenergetics to scavenge all the glucose it can from its environment. And so a tumor that has a lesion in any of these three steps of the pathway becomes constitutive for glucose uptake and it takes up glucose in proportion to exactly what it can find out in the environment, and that turns it PET positive in this assay that you've heard about before that we use in the clinic. At the same time, downstream of AKT, the activation of TOR directly and indirectly by multiple pathways, one of which has already been summarized in terms of TSA2 today, TOR is activated downstream of this pathway, and that reprograms amino acids from catabolism in the mitochondria to being used to to initiate increased protein synthesis through tRNA charging, increased amino acid transporter surface expression, and increased translational initiation at the ribosome through the regulation of translation initiation. And so amino acids are redirected into protein synthesis. At the same time, downstream of these events, in ways that are not actually summarized, that downstream of the AKT signaling pathway, there's a profound reprogramming of the mitochondria. Now, mitochondria are an essential organelle in all eukaryotic cells, not because they make oxidative phosphorylation. There are many species of eukaryotic organisms that lack the ability in their mitochondria to carry out oxidative phosphorylation, but none can live without a mitochondria that has synthetic capability. And so the reprogramming of glucose metabolism allows the mitochondria to turn from a catabolic organelle to an anabolic organelle in which the excess glucose flooding through the cell is actually redirected into synthetic processes. You heard about that for non-essential amino acids and other uh, intermediates in macromolecular synthesis, but one of the key ones we had covered early on was the ability to, to vent in the TCA cycle, excess citrate out into the cytosol, and to degrade that citrate into acetyl-CoA to provide the building block for all the lipid biosynthesis of the phospholipids that the cell would need during growth. And so this pathway activated 
constitutionally activated the cell's ability to grow because cells are a bag of proteins surrounded by a lipid bilayer. And so the cell at every stage of the cell cycle can be shown with activations in this pathway to, have, to be larger because of this net protein synthesis and this net lipid, lipid synthesis. And so the cell is cell autonomous now for its bioenergetics if it has an activating mutation in these pathways. It's also cell autonomous its ability to produce proteins and lipids at maximum rates. It becomes absolutely addicted to glucose metabolism, and that's what led to many people in cancer biology thinking, rethinking the idea of are there ways to intervene in glycolysis to affect the cell that has an activating mutation in this pathway. But the problem in the initial five years of our working on this is it didn't really explain the proliferation of cancer cells from a metabolic standpoint, because this is a carbon source. And ultimately, to be able to divide, cells need to be able to replicate their DNA and their RNA, and that required a nitrogen source. And when we looked at that and we started to reason what we put as a nitrogen source into tissue culture media, the major amino acid in all tissue culture media, and in fact, the one most constantly regulated in our bloodstream by the, by glu by the liver system, is glutamine. And we discovered the downstream of all independent receptor tyrosine kinase signaling, often engaging the RAS oncogene, but always requiring the oncogene MYC, you got a reprogramming when this pathway was activated where cells were now constitutively able to scavenge glutamine from their environment. And MYC turned on a transcriptional cassette that Chi has talked about that activates the ability of the cell to capture glutamine, deaminate it to provide what has been termed anaporosis, the maintenance of the TCA cycle, but more importantly, the nitrogen source for nucleotide biosynthesis, as well as the energy source for both fat and nucleotide biosynthesis, the production of NADPH. And so that reasoning that that's the metabolic machine or the metabolic requirements of proliferating cells leads you to two independent pathways already discovered as regulators of oncogenesis. And in fact, if you combine, as has been done in transgenic mice, an activated MYC oncogene with an activated AKT oncogene in the B cell lineage. The B cell lineage in a mouse starts at day 18 of embryogenesis. Animals are born at 21 days. And every mouse with those two transgenes in their B cell lineage dies at birth of a B cell lymphoma. So these are the most avidly proliferating cells that can have when you combine the two essential nutrients a cell needs to take up if you take our metabolic perspective. 